in the dark shadows, in the white cold. Fearlessly we search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes. The order of the abracast. We are the brave and the bold. The magic will is in its essence twofold. For it presupposes a beginning and an end to will to be a thing is to admit that you are not that thing. Hence to will anything but the supreme thing is to wander further from it. Any will but that to give up the self to the beloved is black magic. Yet this surrender is so simple an act. That to our complex minds, it is the most difficult of all acts, and hence training is necessary. Further, the self-surrender must not be less than the all-self. One must not come before the altar of the Most High with an impure or an imperfect offering. As it is written, to wait, the is the end, not the beginning. This training may lead through all sorts of complications, varying according to the nature of the student, and hence it may be necessary for him at any moment to will all sorts of things which to others might seem unconnected with the goal. Thus it is not a priori. Obvious why a billiard player should need a file. Since then... We may want anything. Let us see to it that our will is strong enough to obtain anything we want without loss of time. It is, therefore, necessary to develop the will to its highest point, even though the last task but one is the total surrender of this will. Partially surrender of an imperfect will is of no account magic. The will being a lever, a fulcrum, is necessary. This fulcrum is the main aspiration of the student to attain. All wills which are not dependent upon this principle will are so many leakages. They are like fat to the athlete. The majority of the people in this world are atastic. They cannot coordinate their mental muscles to make a purposed movement. They have no real will, only a set of wishes many of which contradict others. The victim wobbles from one to the other, and it is no less wobbling because these movements may occasionally be very violent. And at that end of life, the moments cancel each other out. Nothing has been achieved. Nothing is the one thing of which the victim is not conscious. The destruction of his own character, the confirming of indecision, such a one is torn limb from limb by Corazon. How then is the will to be trained? All these wishes, whims, caprice, Inclinations, tendencies, appetites must be detected, examined, judged by a standard of whether they help or hinder the main purpose and treated accordingly. Now there are great difficulties to be overcome in the training of the mind. Perhaps the greatest is forgetfulness. Special practice for training the memory can be of some use as a preliminary for persons whose memory is naturally poor like luminosity or concentration. That was me. Above above all practices of Libra three must be done again and again for these practices develop not only vigilance to those inhabiting centers in the brain, which are according to some psychologists, the mainspring of the mechanism by which civilized man has raised himself above the savage. So far it has been spoken, as it were, in the negative Aaron's rod has become a serpent and swallowed the serpents of the other magicians. It is now necessary to turn it once more into a rod. 
This magical will is the wand in your hand by which the great work is accomplished, by which the daughter is not merely set upon the throne of the mother, but assumed into the highest. The magic wand is thus the principal weapon of the magus. And the name of that wand is the magical oath. The will being twofold is the chakma, who is the logos, the word. Hence, some have said that word is the will. Toth, the lord of magic, is also the lord of speech. Hermes, the messenger, bears the caduceus. Word should express will, hence the mystic's name of the prohibitioner is the expression of his highest will. There are, of course, few prohibitioners who understand themselves sufficiently to be able to formulate this will to themselves, and therefore, at the end of their prohibition, they choose a new name. It is convenient, therefore, for the student to express his will by taking magical oaths. Since such an oath is irrevocable, it should be well considered, and it is better not to take any oath permanently, because with increase of understanding may come a perception of the incompatibility of the lesser oath with the greater. Another great point is this consideration of magic vows is to keep them in their proper place. They must be taken for a clearly defined purpose, a clearly understood purpose, and they must never be allowed to get beyond it. The best vow, and that is most universal application, is the vow of holy obedience. For not only does it lead to perfect freedom, but it is training in that surrender is the last task. A real magical oath cannot be broken. You think it can, but it cannot. This is the advantage of a real magical oath. However far you go around, you arrive at the end in just the same, and you have done by attempting to break your oath is to involve yourself in the most frightful trouble. It cannot be too clearly understood. Is... Uh, such the nature of things. It does not depend on the will of any persons, however powerful or exalted, nor can their force, the force of their great oaths, avail against the weakest oath of the most trivial of beginners. The attempt to interfere with the magical will of another person would be wicked if it were not absurd. One may attempt to build up a will before nothing existed but a chaos of whims. But once organization has taken place, it is sacred, as Blake says, everything that lives is holy. And hence the creation of life is the most sacred of tasks. It does not matter very much to the creator what it is that he creates. There is room in the universe for both the spider and the fly. It is from the rubbish heap of Corazon that one selects the material for a god. This is the ultimate analysis of the mystery of redemption and is possibly the real reason for existence, if existence can be called, of form, or if you like, of the ego. It is astonishing that this typical cry, I am I, is the cry of that which above all is not I. It was the master whose will was so powerful that its lightest expression, the deaf heard and the dumb spake and lepers were cleansed and the dead arose to life. That master that no other who at the supreme moment of his agony could cry, not my will, but thine be done. This is chapter six of Lieber four magic from uh, Alistair Crowley. The Abracast, a cult 
history, conspiracy, and violence. Recording far below the pillar of severity in the ritual space underneath the building headquarters of Stigmata Studios in the heart of the Steel City. I am John Towers and this is the Aber Test. Thank you guys for tuning in. I appreciate it. We're picking up uh, our Libra 4, the, um, the Libra often just called Magic by Alistair Crowley. Uh, we're continuing on our, um, talk about that. So, uh, yeah. So I thought we would just knock the wand out real quick. I'd like to add, uh, in light of that wand, um, with all of our tarot card business that the wand is a masculine, it's a phallic symbol. It's a kingly symbol, just as much as the cup is a feminine symbol, which we are going to be talking about next. But first, uh, we'd like to remind you that there, the Easter sermon is still up. So the Easter sermon is something special that I did, um, for Easter. Uh, it's the first time that I preached the gospels, I guess you could say, um, it is available for free on Patreon and subscribe star. So you just go on to the Patreon or subscribe star page associated with the Abercast and scroll down a few. There's some archived episodes, uh, two or three or four maybe, uh, but you'll find one that's unlocked and that's a bonus episode you can find there. Uh, it's interesting. I've gotten a lot of great feedback, um, from it. So, I mean, you might want to mm, check it out if you haven't caught it yet. Also, uh, starting next month, we're going to be doing a magician sticker may. So everyone that signs up on Patreon or subscribe star, we'll just start it for now, whatever, um, for the month of may plus this week, <laughs> uh, above a $5 and above. So you $5 or $10 tier, I'm going to send you a free sticker and they're not available anywhere else. Um, it's the the magician of the major arcana for the tarot cards that I've designed. They're still, I'm waiting for the proof from the printer. I'm hoping to hear something back very soon. And I know I have at least one or two little tweaks to do, uh, before they become available, but, um, they're great. If you want to take a look at them, a sneak peek, you can sign into the mailing list and you get a link, uh, that you could see all of the cards right there that are completed and are done major arcana, minor arcana. And with that being said, uh, I thought it would be fitting for this episode to point out that I did a Crowley's magic circle t-shirt. So you can practice social distancing before it was cool, bro. With this magic, uh, this magic circle shirt, you could go on the, um, the abercast.com, go to the shop, t-shirts and stuff and you can find that and many other t-shirts there i'm sporting mine right now i just got it it's very cool so speaking of subscribe star and patreon supporters we got a, um three new supporters uh here's to so get your vessel of the art if you're generous enough to have an official vessel of the art Fill it with your favorite weapon of mass distraction. Mine is a Jin Jihad. This evening, raise uh, your vessel to the sky and offer a toast to our new supporters. Uh, we got I don't want to dox anyone. Joe, Jesse, and uh, Emily. Thank you, guys. They are all three brand new Vessel of the Art supporters. So I'll get your vessels out to you uh, soon, everybody. I'll probably, yeah, get some vessels out to you guys. And you guys that are already supporters above the $5 tier, I'll be sending you out some um, magician stickers as well. So if I owe you any of that stuff, it's coming. 
and keep an eye on your email accounts, you guys, because I'll be uh, trying to schedule your call times for um, May as well very soon. All right, let's get to it. Chapter, oh, did I say the wand was chapter seven? The wand is chapter six. This is uh, the cup. This is chapter seven. Where am I at? Oh, mm. As the magic wand is the will, the wisdom, and the word of the magician, so is the magic cup his understanding. This is the cup of which it was written, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. And again, can you drink of the cup that I drink of? And it is also the cup in the hand of Our Lady Babylon and the cup of the sacrament. This cup is full of bitterness and of blood and of intoxication. I'm going to take a second and toast to that. The understanding of the magus and his link with his invisible on the passive side, his will errs effectively by opposing itself to the universal will. His understanding errs passively, and it receives influence from that which is not of the ultimate truth. In the beginning, the cup of the student is almost empty, here, here, and even such tr truths as he receives may leak away and may be lost. That shit may evaporate. What are you nursing that, newbie? <laughs> are you nursing it? <laughs> They say that <laughs> the Venetians made glass which changed color if poison was put into them. Of such a glass, the student must make his cup. The very little experience on the mystical path will show him that of all of the impressions he receives, he receives none is true. Either they are false in themselves or they are wrongly interpreted in his mind. There is one truth and only one. All other thoughts are false. And if he advances in the knowledge of his mind and he comes to understand that its, tr uh, its whole structure is so faulty that it is quite incapable, even in its most exalted moods of truth. He will recognize that any thoughts merely establishes a relation between the ego and the non-ego. Even the laws of nature are but the conditions of thought. And as the current of thought is the blood of the mind, and it is said that the magic cup is filled with the blood of the saints, all thought must be offered up as a sacrifice. The cup can hardly be described as a weapon. It is round like the pinnacle and not straight like the wand and the dagger. Its reception, not protection, is its nature. So that which is round is to him a symbol of influence from the higher. The circle symbolizes the infinite as every cross or tau represents the finite. That which is four square shows the finite fixed onto itself. For this reason, the altar is four square. It is the solid basis which all operations per, uh, proceeds. One form of the magical cup has a sphere beneath the bowl. Sphere beneath the bowl. A circle beneath the bowl. And it is supported upon a canonical base. So there's a real weird uh, way to look at it here. This cup is a crescent, is, uh, is a sphere. Think of it as a crescent upturned. So the open end is in, the open end is northward. Like imagine it like a cup. And then there's this canonical uh, shape and then this circle underneath it forming the base. It's like, it's kind of like a wine glass, right? This crescent sphere cone represents the tr three principles of the moon, the sun and of fire. 
This is the cup of purification, as Zoe Astor says. So, therefore, first the priest who governeth the work of fire must sprinkle with the lustral water of the loud, resounding sea. It is the sea that purifies this world, and this great sea is the Kabbalah, the name of Binna. It's understanding. So he's already thrown out a couple Kabbalah references here. Binna is one of them in um, Chakma, I think uh, we talked about in the cold open, is the other one. You can go to the Kabbalah section of the feature topic links at abercast.com. See all that stuff there. Back to it. It is by the understanding of the Megas that his work is purified. Bina, moreover, is the moon, and the bowl of this cup is shaped like the moon. The moon is the path, the uh, path of Gimel through which the influence from the crown descends upon the sons of Tipvereth. So if you think of the Kabbalistic tree of life, there's a couple of ways to move down through it. Um, and this is what he's, this is what he's talking about. Gimel actually has a moon connection as well. Yeah, this is go listen to David Bowie's station to station. Uh, uh, without getting into the whole thing, that's it. it uh, and this is based upon the pyramid of fire, which symbolizes the aspiration of the student concerning the water in this cup. It is said that just as the wand should be perfectly rigid, the ideal solid, so should the water be an ideal fluid. The wand is erect and must extend to infinity. The surface of the water is flat and must extend into infinity. One is the line and the other is the plane. But it is uh, the wand is weak without breath so that the water is false without depth. The understanding of the Megas must include all things and all understanding must be infinitely profound. Understanding is the structuralization of knowledge. The magic cup is also the flower. It's the lotus which opens to the sun and which collects the dew. The lotus is the hand of Isis, the great mother. It is the symbol similar to the cup in the hand of our lady Babylon. There are also lotuses in the human body, according to the Hindu system of physiology. And there is the lotus of three petals in the sacrum, which the Kundalini lies asleep. And the lotus is a receptacle of reproductive force. So this is all, if you get into our feature topic link again on Abercast.com and go to the sex magic section, you're going to hear a lot about this Kundalini and all this. Receptic, the rigid... <laughs> Wand and the, the deep cavernous cups as a receptacle for the reproductive force. Back to it. There's also a six petal lotus opposite the navel, which receives the force which nourish the body. This is where this is the base of your spine. This is where the Kundalini coils. There is an also a lotus in the solar plexus, which receives nervous force. The six-petaled lotus in the heart corresponds to Tiferath. This is another uh, Sephiroth of the Kabbalistic tree of life. And it receives those vital forces which are connected with the blood. The 16-petaled lotus opposite of the larynx receives the nourishment needed by the breath. And two-petaled lotus uh, 
of the pineal gland um, receives the nourishment needed by thought, while above the junctions of the cranial structures is the sublime lotus of the thousand and one petals which receives influence on high and which in the adept awakened kundalini takes her pleasure from the lord of all. These lotuses are all figured by the magic cup. So if you kind of want to, um, oh, I got to shuffle through some bullshit right now. If you want a kind of an idea of like a visual representation of this here, let me get my, um, my Thoth deck. This is the deck that Crowley, um, designed. He designed he told this artist what to do for the, for the representation of these cards. And he's describing a v very specific card. Hold on. I'm trying to find it. All right. So there's like, um, there's in the suit of cups in Crowley's deck, there are three cards that have flowers or lotuses on them. The three and the six and the nine, but uh, if you go, if you listen, he's actually calling out six of these lotuses. And this is a card that he calls pleasure. It's the six of cups. It's got these lotuses and they're kind of like, you know, like when you're, you know, when you're watching porn and like the chicks start squirting, these lotuses are like squirting into these, into these cups light rays or like vaginal magic or something. So if you match up this card with the uh, sort of like the Kabbalistic tree of life where there's the, where there's 10 Sephiroths, we're only dealing with six. So it's not a perfect one for one analog, but you can kind of see it the way it's like laid out. And it's interesting because in vaguely the spot where the Doth would be, or like the missing um, Sephiroth or what they would call the, uh, Tohu and Bohu. This is the chaos that's programmed in the Kabbalistic tree of life. There's a, like an out, al it's a symbol. It's an alchemical symbol of the, the sun, which kind of seems like it's the dead, the dead giveaway that this is the card that, that he's talking about. Anyhow, yeah, you could probably Google search the images on these cards to see, uh, the, all the, v um, <laughs> all the <laughs> all the uh, lotuses and cups and uh, pussy magic. So, uh, all right, back to it. <laughs> the magic cup must have no lid, yet must be kept veiled most carefully at all times, except when invocation of the highest is being made. The cup must also be hidden from the profane. The wand must be kept secret, lest the profane, fearing it, should succeed in breaking it. The cup, lest wishing to touch it, they should defile it. This is all very dirty. Thus, ultimately, as the wand is binding in the limitation, so the cup is an expansion into the infinite. And this is the danger of the cup. Fucking tell me about it. It is necessarily to be open to all. And yet if anything is put into it, which is out of proportion, unbalanced or impure, it takes hurt. Since at the best of this water is but a reflection of how tremendously important it is uh, to become that it should, it should be still. The water should be still. If the cup is shaken to the light, it will be broken up. Therefore, the cup is placed upon the altar, which is four square, will multiply by will, the confirmation of the will in the magical oath. Its fixation is the law.
Hi everyone, I'm Jess and I host the podcast Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos. I like to discuss a little bit of everything that's weird or unusual, from hauntings and folklore to true crime and history. I'm not only a podcaster, but I'm also a practicing witch, so I've made sure to dedicate a few episodes to the subject and dispel some of the common misconceptions about the craft. So if this sounds like your cup of tea, you can find Shoes, Booze, and Tattoos anywhere you get podcasts. And remember that booze is spelled B-O-O-S. I hope to see you all soon. Bye! Learn more at abracast.com. Get bonus content by signing up for the mailing list. Get all that plus many exclusive episodes by supporting the show at patreon.com or subscribestar.com. Chapter 7, The Sword. The word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Wait, hold on. Before we get into that, let me remind everybody that the Easter Sermon is still available on Patreon and Subscribestar. It is a free episode. It's the first time I'm kind of preaching gospel-y kind of stuff. Um... I mean, I do a lot of, like, Pastor Larry Solomon, by the power of Jesus, but um, this is, like, a for real message coming through. It's called The Easter Sermon in Quarantine, The Psychological Crisis of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's interesting, and it's positive, and I, can't, I went into it with a real um, message, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback from it. Um, so I wanted just to leave it up there and make it available for you guys for a little bit longer. Um, the, uh, yeah, if you go to the subscribe star or the Patreon for the Abercast, you just scroll down. There's a couple archived episodes that will be locked, uh, but then you'll get into this one and it's unlocked and anyone can listen to it for free. You don't have to be a subscriber or a Patreon to get to it. So, uh, since it is still April and it's still Easter season, I thought that I would bring it to everybody's attention. And anyone who sticks around and becomes of a, a supporter on Patreon or Subscribestar f- on a $5 or $10 degree, and then, and only then, will I, <laughs> will I send you a magician sticker for Magician Sticker May. Um, it is the, the magician for the tarot card deck that I just designed and will be available shortly. Uh, but you can only get the sticker here. I took it all platforms. You can't buy it anywhere. It's like the only, only place you can get it. And it's sweet. It's a sweet sticker. It's not just our logo. You know, it's like, it's something cool. There's actually like boobs on it. So, I mean, come on, there's that. (laughs) And if you're like, well, I need to get a look at this card. Um, you can always sign up for the Fulgar Correspondentia, which is the mailing list. You can always sign up for the mailing list, and there's a link to an exclusive preview of all the cards there. You can check that out. And also, I can't be remiss, we're doing a Libra 4 episode. So, hey, jump on Abercast.com, go to the store section, go to t-shirts and stuff, and check out the social distancing t-shirt that we have. Uh, we're doing, uh, we have a uh, Thelemic or at least the uh, magic circle that Crowley talked about in Libra 4 that we actually covered last episode. We have a whole t-shirt. I got rid of all the color descriptions that he did, and I just did it in black and red. It's fucking sweet looking. Go check it out. Where was I? Chapter 7. The Sword. The word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. As the wand is Chakma, the will, the father, and the cup, the understanding, the mother, the bina, and the magic sword is the reason, the sun, the sixth sephiroth of the rauch. 
And we see the pentacle corresponds with the Malkuth or the daughter. So here, I got to do a couple quick bits here. Uh, if you go back to the abercast.com, the feature topic link and get into the tarot card episodes, you're going to see this, that he's operating on the tetragrammaton, uh, the tetragrammaton code of the tarot where it's yod, hey, vo, hey is the name of God in four letters yod hey vo hey so you have to think of it as like a north south east west yod first hey yod north first hey west vo south second hey east it's the masculine the feminine the product or the neutral and then the second hey is this transitionary period. And this is exactly why if you go and look at my <laughs> if you go and look at my um uh the preview, if you sign into the mailing list and find the and get the link to go check out the preview of the tarot cards, this is why I took out the pages and they're the princesses. So it's king, queen, knight, and princess. It's specifically about this chapter of Crowley's of Crowley's deck. She that princess holds the transitionary spot. Now on the Toth deck, Crowley's deck, he actually does King, Queen, Knight, Prince, and then Princess. So um Maybe I'll figure that out as we, as we go on. If you're like, what is this Malkuth business? Like I said, just go listen to station to station by David, David Bowie. Okay. So I love magic swords. Let's, let's get into it. The magic sword is the analytical faculty directed against any demon it attacks as complexity. Only the simple can w un can withstand the sword. Only the simple can withstand the sword. <laughs> I love Just get on Facebook and try to talk to somebody. Get on Facebook and try to debate somebody right now. This is what you're going to get. Uh, what is that quote? Mark Twain. I think it's Mark Twain or Mark Einstein or Albert. Finney or maybe it's Bill Murray. I don't know about not being able to win an argument with it, with a idiot, with an ignorant person. Only the simple can withstand the sword as we are below the abyss. This weapon is then entirely destructive. It divides Satan against Satan. It is only in the lower forms of magic, the purely human forms, that the sword has become so important a weapon. Now, I brought this up the other day. I was talking to a colleague, and we were talking about magic swords and such. And I brought up this, this specific thing where Crowley actually, he does not look it seems like he doesn't like the magic sword because he goes on to say in this paragraph, a dagger should be sufficient. Uh, it's super interesting to me because it reminds me of the Babylon working where Jack Parsons was running around his mansion with his magic sword, trying to fight this <laughs> glowing <laughs> orb spirit. That's like tormenting him. <laughs> but the mind of man is normally so important to him that the sword is actually the largest of his weapons. Happy is he who can make the dagger suffice. The hilt of the sword should be made of copper. The guard is composed of two crescents of the waxing and waning moon back to back. The spheres are placed between them, forming an equilateral triangle with the sphere of the pommel. The blade is straight, pointed, and sharp right up to the guard, and it is made of steel to equilibrate with the hilt, for steel is the metal of Mars, and copper is the metal of 
of Venus. Those two planets are male and female, and thus reflect the wand and the cup through a much lower sense. So remember, in the Tetragrammaton layout, the key of the Tetragrammaton layout of the tarot is the yod he vo he. The yod is the kingly or the male. The wand, the cup, hey, the first hey, the cup is female. The knight or the vo, the sword, is the neuter. It's what, what comes out of the joining of those two. So it's interesting that he's building his sword, incorporating aspects of the wand and the cup. We're going to see here in a second that the white and the black suns or the moons of Baphomet, Chesed, Kindness, and Gavora, Strength. We see these pop up from uh, the Baphomet episode we did a long time ago. It might actually be archived by now. Is Obviously, these are the two Sephiroths from the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And... Um, any and all of the Kabbalistic episodes, the black moon and the white moon, the, co the coagulae and the solva. The hilt is of, back to it, I'm sorry I was babbling, the hilt is of Venus, for love is the motive of this ruthless analysis. If this were not so, the sword would be a black magical weapon. The pommel of the sword is doth. That's We talked about Doth before. That's the hidden or missing or phantom or shadow Sephiroth in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. If I look at my tattoo, there's like the three Sephiroths that are a triangle and then they go on as like a five Sephiroths underneath it and then the two Sephiroths underneath that. Between the three and the five, there's this empty space and that's where the Doth doth lie. It's the hidden Sephiroth. It's between the supernal and the ethical triangle. Again, hit up your feature topic link. The guard extends to Chesed and Geborah. Is the point is the Malkuth. Some magi make the three spheres of lead, tin, and gold, respectively. The moons are silver, and the grips contain quicksilver, thus making the sword symbolic of the seven planets. But this is a fantasy and an affection. Whoso taketh the sword, perish by the sword, is not a mystical threat, but a mystical promise. It is our own complexity that must be destroyed. Here is another parable. Peter, the stone of the philosophers, cut off the ear of Malchus, and the servant of the high priest. The ear, it is to be noted, is an organ of the spirit. In analysis, the spiritual part of Malkuth must be separated from the philosophical stone. And then Critias, the anointed one, makes the whole once more. Solve et coagule. I just fucking said that. Which again <laughs> is Elephus Levi's Baphomet. It is the Baphomet. Uh, the arm pointing to the white moon of Chesed is Solve, and the arm pointing down to the black moon of Gavora is Coagule. It is noticeable that this takes place at the arrest of a Jesus Christ, who is the son of Rauche immediately before his crucifixion. Rauche, we're going to be talking a lot about this over this episode. Rauche is a Kabbalistic term for the essential parts of the human spirit. Nefesh, Rauche, and Neshama. Rauche just means wind or breath or sometimes the mind of a human. Uh, this, that was me. We're back to the book. The sword or dagger is attributed to air, all wandering, all penetrating, but unstable. Not as a phenomenon, subtle like fire. Not as a chemical combination like water, but a mixture of gases. The sword, necessary as it is to the beginner, but it is a crude weapon. 
It's not an elegant weapon like the weapon of a Jedi made for a much more civilized time. Its function is to keep off the enemy or to force passage through them. Through it must be wielded to gain admiss admission to the palace. It cannot be worn at the marriage feast. One might say the pentacle is the bread of life and the sword is the knife which cuts it up. One must have ideas, but one must criticize them. The sword, too, is that weapon with which to strike terror into the demons and, and dominates them. One must keep the ego lord of impressions, and one must not allow the circle to be broken by the demon. One must not allow any one idea to carry one away. It will readily be seen how elementary and false all this is, but for the beginner it is necessary. In all dealings with demons, the point of the sword is to be kept downwards, and it should not be used for invocation, as it is taught in certain schools of magic. If the sword is raised towards the crown, it is no longer really a sword. The crown cannot be divided. Certainly the sword shall not be lifted. The sword may, however, be clasped in both hands and kept steady and erect, symbolizing that thought has become one with a single aspiration and burn up like a flame. This flame is the shin, the rauch alamin, and the mere rauch adamin, adam, the divine and not the human consciousness. The magician cannot wield the sword unless the crown is on his head. Those magicians who have attempted to make the sword or the soul or even the principal weapon have only destroyed themselves. Not by the destruction of combination, but of by the destruction of division. Weakness overcomes strength. The sword has been a great weapon of the last century. Every idea has been attacked by thinkers, and none has withstood the attack. Hence, civilization crumbles. No settled principles remain to this day. All constructive statesmanship is empiricism or opportunism. It has been doubted whether there is a real relation between mother and child, any real distinction between male and female. Wow! On the blade of the magic sword is etched the name Agla, the notochorian form from the initials of the sentence Ata Gibor Lehem Adonai. To thee be the power unto the ages of my Lord. A Notwaragarian, <laughs> Notaguan, is just a way to signify a phrase, uh, which is a group of letters, usually the initials of these letters. Kabbalistic use, Kabbalists use this method. Back to the book. And the acid that eats into the steel should be of oil and vitriol. Vitriol is a notaquan of vista in Torah terror, terray rectif, rectificando <laughs> envies oculum lepidium. That is to say, by investigating everything and bringing it into harmony and proportion, you will find the hidden stone. And the same stone of the philosophers of which mentioned has already been made, which turns all into gold. This oil which can eat into the steel is further that which is written. As an acid, it eats into the steel. So... Am I unto the spirit of man? The center of Rauch being the heart, it is seen that this sword of the Rauch must be thrust by the magician into his own heart. 
but there is a subsequent task of which it is spoken. Quote, he shall await the sword of the beloved and bear his throat for the stroke. Unquote. In this throat is Doth, this hidden Sephiroth, which we've been talking about. The throne of Roch. Doth is knowledge, the final destruction, the knowledge which opens the gate of the city of the pyramids. And it is also written, let the woman be girt with the sword before me. But this refers to the overcoming of emotion by clarity of perception. Parsons also talked about this woman girt with the sword. The sword. Um, you can visit the... Uh, Abercast.com and go to the Thelema slash Jack Parsons section and hear all about it. Back to this book. It is also spoken the sword of Adonai that hath four blades and blades of the thunderbolts, the blades of the python, uh, pylon, the blades of the serpent and the blade of the phallus. This sword is not for the ordinary magician. For this is the sword of flaming every way that keeps Eden, and this sword, the wand, and the cup are concealed. So that although the being of the magician is blasted by the thunderbolt and poisoned by the serpent, at the same time the organ whose union is the supreme sacrament are left in him. This this is it sounds like the sword of expulsion that Uriel wielded in the Garden of Eden. I wrote a book about that once. At the coming of the Adonai, the individual is destroyed in both senses. He is shattered into a thousand pieces, yet at the same time united with the simple. The thing about the flaming sword that keeps Eden is after the fall, God stationed Uriel at the gates of Eden with the fiery sword to guard against mankind, I guess, reentering the garden, I suppose, sneaking back in. It is also called the sword of expulsion. It is the cover. Like I said, I wrote a, it's in a book that I wrote a long time ago. Uriel, uh, he's all over the the place uh, the, the back to it the lord is adonai which is the hebrew for my lord he descends from heaven in the supernal eden the shashranana chakra in man with a shout a voice and a trump again airy symbols uh, for it is air that carries sound. The sound refers to those heard by the adept in the moment of rapture. This is most accurately pictured in the tarot trump called the angel, which corresponds to the letter Shin, the letter of the spirit of the breath. Uh, most of us these days would recognize this as the temperance card. The whole mind of man is rent by the advent of Adonai and is once caught upon the union with him in the air. All right, bang. Let's see. Uh, it was the function of the cup to inter interpret the perceptions by the tendencies. The sword frees the perception from this web of emotions. The perceptions are meaningless in themselves, but the emotions are worse for they delude their victims into supposing them uh, significant and true. Every emotion is an obsession. The most horrible of blasphemies uh, is to attribute any emotion to God in the macrocosm or the pure soul in the microcosm. The magician must therefore make himself absolutely free in this respect. It is a constant practice of demons to attempt to terrify, to shock, to disgust, to allure. Against all this, he must oppose the steel of the sword. If he has gotten rid of the ego idea, this task can be uh, comparatively easy. Unless he has done so, it will almost be impossible. 
but it is too much to accept the uh, of the young expect of the young magician to practice attachments to the distasteful. Let him first become indifferent. Let him endeavor to see facts as facts as simply as he would see them if they were historical, and let him avoid the imaginative interpretations of any facts. Let him not put himself in the place of the people of whom the facts are related. Or if he does so, let it be done only for the purpose of comprehension, sympathy, and then let the student practice observation over these things normally. This would cause him emotion. And let him, having written a careful description of what he sees, check it by the aid of some person familiar with such sights. Surgical operations and dancing girls are fruitful fields for the beginner. In reading emotional books such as are inflicted upon children, let him always endeavor to see the, um, the event from a standpoint opposite of that to the author. Look, he's teaching you how to analyze something. It's great. He's doing what he's doing, what I've called, I'm sure I'm not the only person that's called this, but the shoes on the other foot game. It's interesting yet. Uh, let him not emulate the partial emancipated child who complained of a picture of the Colosseum that there was one poor little lion that hadn't gotten any Christian except <laughs> in the in, uh, in the first instance. Adverse criticism is the first step and the second must go further, having sympathized sufficiently. With both the lions and the Christians, let him open his eyes to that which his sympathy has masked hitherto. And the picture is abominably conceived, uh, dominantly composed, and abominably drawn, and abominably colored, as it is pretty sure to be. Let him further study those masters in science and art who have observed with minds unaffected by emotions. All right. I'm John. This is the Abercast. Hey, thank you guys for listening. Special thank you to all the supporters and special thank you for all the new supporters. Um, just a quick reminder, the Easter sermon on Patreon, subscribe star for free. You don't have to be, uh, subs you don't have to be a supporter to get the episodes. Just scroll down. There'll be a couple locked episodes and then there'll be one that's unlocked. That's the one you should listen to. It's all about the gospel. It's all about shadow work. It's a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about tonight. Actually, if you look into it a little bit, um, want to remind everybody, if you become a five or $10 supporter on Patreon and subscribe star right now through the end of may uh it's magician sticker may i'll send you a magician sticker you can't get anywhere else it's out of the tarot cards i uh, designed there's boobs in it it's a it's a fucking cool card let's just be honest if you want to get a, a sneak peek at the deck before it's available you sign into the mailing list uh it'll send you a link to go to a place where you can go and look at the whole deck of cards minor arcana major arcana right there and since we're talking about Libra 4, we're talking about Crowley and Thelema, uh, you hit the shop button while you're there, go to t-shirts and stuff, and find the uh, the social distancing before it was cool. The uh, Crowley or Thelema's uh, magic circle, the magic circle that Crowley was talking about last episode um, in any rate. Thank you guys again. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it went a little bit long, but here we go. Thank you for listening to this episode. Send an email or visit us on social media to let us know what you think about this topic. And please remember to leave a five-star rate and review. Hey, did you learn something? 
Did you laugh? Supporting me is a way for you to be a part of the Abercast and ensure its growth and sustainability. It also means I can create a normal schedule for shows and bonus shows, as well as the exclusive Fellow Craft episodes. By supporting the show, you are not only a listener, but you are a part of the show. You supporting the show gives me a way to offer fun rewards as a thank you for showing your appreciation and support for our projects. Do you have an idea for a reward that you don't see? Let me know. My supporters are my partners. I currently pay for you to listen to the Abercast. Not only do I pay the hosting bills out of my own pocket, I volunteer my time and uh, talent to each and every episode of the Abercast. The price of books, the time and resources of reading and researching, the massive amounts of gin and tonic needed, the equipment it takes to record the shows, the time and resources it takes to create the bonus material, and the cost to maintain the internet presence. Is it worth your support? I don't know. I am proud of the Abercast, and I feel like I'm improving all the time. In addition uh, to creating the show that you dig, and that you are excited about, I also have a full-time commitment and other obligations. So why financial support? All of the supporters help me focus my time in on the quality and development of the podcast. And what if you can't afford, you know, $1 or $3 or $10 or whatever a month? Believe me, I get that. There are many degrees of support, but if you can't support the show financially, please consider leaving a five-star rate and review on your preferred podcast app. And don't forget that you could sign into the mailing list and still unlock a lot of bonus content. Thank you. I cannot put into words how much it means to me that you listen to the show each time I post a new episode. Your feedback is support and love of the stories that we talk about here is what keeps me going. 